Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm going to explain to you how a no-op generator works with a 6502, and I'm going to use it to troubleshoot a Commodore 1541 disk drive. Yes, another one. All right, let's get right to it. All right, the next 1541 disk drive. This is a 1541C. This actually came out of the white case on the last video I worked on a 1541. You saw that I worked on that donated drive from Desi and I ended up putting the older 1541 into the white case. So you're sort of mixing the white and the brown. But I want to take a look at this C revision of the 1541. So you see the front of the drive, which I showed before. It's the Neutronics uh, flip down mechanism. So this is different than the Alps mechanism that are on a lot of 1541s. At least the ones I have all seem to be the other push down type, not this flip type. But you did have older 1541s with the same mechanism. They were just that brown color, of course. But since this is from a C drive, it's the light color. It was designed to go with the Commodore 64C, which all had that light color scheme, hence the lack of the brown front. But taking a look at the top of the drive here, it's very interesting what we see right off the bat. I've actually never seen this myself. This is a much shorter board than the normal short board drives. So the original 1541 had a, a long board, it was called. The circuit board went to about here. Then they combined a bunch of stuff into a Gatorade chip, and that made the short board, which came to about here or so. And the last drive I worked on was that type. This is like the super short board, well, or they called the B revision, which is much shorter. What Commodore went ahead and did is they ended up combining additional logic into this chip here, which is a second gate array. So this is one gate array, which the short board has as well. And finally, there's this hybrid module. It's made by Fujitsu. The part number on it is 251853-02. And a bunch of the analog components that were on the short board have been combined into this hybrid on the super short board. So it's just a further cost reduction and a simplification of the parts. So something else is special about this drive, and it has a track zero sensor. So if I move the head back and forth here, there's a little notch thing sticking out right there. Notice it moves back and forth. Well, when I move this all the way to track zero, it goes into this little sensor here, and that's to tell the drive electronics that the head is at the zero position. 8-Bit Guy just put out an excellent video on how Commodore disk drives work, so I recommend you watch that. I'll put a link in the description below. Now, I can't remember in his video if he mentioned if any of the 1541s of the first generation have the track zero sensor, but this was a weird variant of the 1541 first generations, although with this short board, and it has that track zero sensor. So there's a jumper on this board to configure whether the track zero sensor is used and you have to have the right ROMs. And of course you have to have a drive with the sensor, but with all of those things combined, when this goes to format a disc or there's a disc error, you won't hear that loud head knocking sound on this disc drive at least. So the reason why I'm showing this drive right now is because this drive has a fault and it is not working. If I plug in the power and I turn it on, the drive starts to spin and just like that last 1541 I worked on, the light is on, the motor is running, but it's not actually stopping the drive. Now, if you've watched that last video, I mentioned that the processor needs to run code to instruct the IO chips to stop the motor and turn the LED off. So if something is preventing the CPU from properly running the code that's in the ROMs, then it will not do that and the drive will just run continually like it's doing right now. All right, it's time to do some basic troubleshooting. First thing we're gonna do is check the voltages. It's always the first step you're gonna do. So first we'll check the five volt logic and we will do this by testing one of these little bypass caps on the logic chips there. So 5.14 volts, that's a little high, but nothing to really worry about. I think anything over 5.2, might you might start to worry. 5.14 is fine. And then we're gonna check the five volt rail on this connector here, which outputs voltage to this board here, which is sort of a speed controller for the drive motor. So I'm gonna take these two pins right here and I'm getting 12.19 volts, which is looking good. So I'm gonna say that the two voltage regulators here are working totally fine. 
All right, just like last time, we have the oscilloscope, we have the iPad loaded with the schematics for this variant of the 1541. So even though this is the 1541C, Commodore called this the B variant of the board. I will put a link to the schematics down in the description below, but I have it loaded up on the iPad here to help me out for troubleshooting. We're gonna be using the oscilloscope and let's get started. So first off, I have the 6502 right here and I'm gonna check the reset line. This is kind of what we did before. Pin 40 on the 6502 is the reset line. So it is currently high. If I turn off the drive and turn it back on again, we should see it stay low for a second and then go high. Yep, that is working normally. And then we have pin 37, which is the clock signal and we're getting a nice one megahertz clock signal. So I know the clock is good. Next, we're checking pin four, which is the interrupt line that should be high. And then pin six, this is the non-maskable interrupt signal, and that should also be high, and that is correct. Looking at the schematics, the non-maskable interrupt's actually not used on the 1541. It looks like it's just pulled up to five volts, but the IRQ line does go off to something else, so that could possibly be grounded or five volts. Okay, I've rotated the driver, so it's a little easier for me to get to the pins that were on the back side there. So I'm gonna start off looking at the address lines. Remember on our last disk drive, it was frozen in time, the, the 6502. On this one, let's take a look at address line zero, which is pin nine. Okay, so I'm on pin nine and it's just sitting at low. So that's interesting. I'm gonna just cycle the power. Let's see if we see any activity when I first turn it on. Okay, it goes high for a second and then it's just sitting there. So this is address line one, two. Okay, two, we're actually getting kind of a pulsing strobing signal. Three, three is just high. Four has a pulsing, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so it doesn't appear that it's actually executing anything. Uh, this one looks a bit weird. It's just kind of getting a, a pulse going on there. So this is address line nine. And yeah, it's just sort of getting this very fast pulse. Address line 10 has a strobe. And then address line 11 is strobing as well. Address line 12 is tw strobing, 13 strobing, and finally, and then address line 14 is strobing, and finally 15 is strobing. So it really, it seems to be trying to execute. The processor seems to be doing something, like it's instructing the ROMs, but it doesn't actually seem to be really doing anything like if you remember from my last video when it was actually executing code you see a lot of activity on the address lines as it's going through the rom you know it's running it's executing code it's reading and writing out of ram and rom it's doing stuff but if i power cycle this it just immediately goes straight to that and then it just stops so we're going to take a look at the data bus lines so right here we have data bus line seven and there is some activity so to speak it's kind of sort of fluctuating ever so slightly. So that's seven, this is six, that looks the same. Five, very similar. Four, three, two, one, and zero. So all of the address lines looked relatively normal to me, except for this one. This one does not, this one doesn't look correct. This seems like there's an address bus conflict happening See this voltage down in the middle here? That's that's way out of whack. You shouldn't really have something that low. On the data bus, there are the two 6522s, there's the ROM chip, and then there's also the RAM chip. And on this particular board, the RAM and the ROM and the IO select lines are controlled by this new gate array chip right here. I'm looking at it here on the iPad, and it looks like pin 14, 20, 18, and 19 are the chip select lines. So I'm gonna restart the oscilloscope. So this here is the ROM enable pin. So anytime this is low, that is the ROM becoming enabled. And this line right here is the RAM enable pin. So anytime it's low, it's now selecting the RAM chip. And then this here is a select line for the 6522 IO chip. And this is the one for the other one. And you notice they're just high. So they're, neither of those chips are being selected. But looking at the outputs on here, we are seeing selection happening for the ROM and the RAM. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take my second channel on the oscilloscope and connect that to the RAM select line. And I'm gonna use the first channel to look at the ROM select line. 
So when I turn the power on, we should see the waveforms. What you see here is that the two waveforms are exclusive to each other. They aren't overlapping. And that means that this gate array is not telling the ROM and the RAM to be selected simultaneously. Because if that as is happening, that immediately creates a bus conflict and bad things will happen. So this confirms to me that the gate array seems to be not creating a bus conflict by selecting more than one chip at a time. This is what I want to see. But what this is leading me to believe now is that either the ROM or the RAM chip are faulty. To really execute any code, a 6502 processor needs some RAM. It's called the zero page and it needs that to work. So if there's faulty RAM on here and it's this SRAM chip from Sanyo, it's not going to be able to execute anything. But the ROM itself also needs to be good because when you power on the 6502, it goes to the reset vector, which is FFF C or D or whatever it is I talked about in my last video, and it starts to execute code out of the ROM. So if either of these chips are bad, then this thing will not be able to execute any code whatsoever. And unfortunately, you may notice that not a single chip on this board is socketed. So I am going to have to desolder the RAM and the ROM. Now, I've heard on good authority that this Sanyo SRAM that is used in this particular disk drive is a particularly unreliable SRAM chip. And I should probably start by removing that chip. Now, the thing is, I intend to actually use this board in another project because it combines both of the old ROM chips that the other 1541 has into a standard 27128 ROM chip, which means I can burn a standard EEPROM and install this in here. So I want to make this board work. And I think I'm going to just desolder the SRAM and the ROM chip simultaneously. And then I'll be able to take the ROM chip and I'll read that out in my mini pro to make sure that it is correct. I can validate it is good just from the mini pro. And the SRAM, unfortunately, I'm going to have to find a spare out of something else and pop it into here and see if that fixes it. So something I recommend doing on 1541s before you unplug these connectors, make sure you take a marker and you swipe up on the connector and on the bottom so that when you unplug this, it is very obvious the way that this goes back on because it is these connectors aren't keyed and you could technically plug this in backwards. So the black mark is there and it's also on the bottom and that will tell me that I will not put this on wrong. And I drew I drew a black mark right here on this connector as well for the same reason. I could turn this around and plug this in that way and that would cause damage on the drive. You definitely don't want to do that. So this is the board. I've taken it out and it had an RF shield on the bottom, which, you know, I took that off immediately. But check out this bodge. How sketchy is that? They didn't even bother to cut the legs off. This was definitely a Commodore bodge. They just tacked it on right there and just, ah, that's fine. We'll just leave it. Ah, so lazy. All right, I've done some desoldering. So these are the two chips that came out of this super short board. I have two sockets sitting in here. They're not actually installed. I wanted to test these first. I almost feel like I don't want to waste two sockets on this board. If one of the Gatorade chips is bad, especially this one, then this board, there's no saving it, unfortunately. I, I It will be relegated to spare parts. What that means is I would like to try to at least test this ROM chip, make sure it's good, and then that leaves us with the static RAM. So this static RAM is one I actually took off this short board here. This is a spare parts one that's been in my spare parts bin for forever. But yeah, I had to desolder that from there. This is a Hitachi brand chip. And then this Sanyo one, yeah, it's came off here. But I don't have an easy way to test these, unfortunately. At least I don't think I do. So this chip I took out of this board might be bad as well. This, this board didn't work when I got it, and that's why all the chips are gone. But anyways, let's first test the ROM chip in the Mini Pro and see how that goes. All right, the ROM chip is installed in the Mini Pro right here. And according to the schematics, it is a 27128. So I've picked AM27128. It doesn't matter. I'm not programming this. I just need to read it out. So let's hit read and read out the ROM. So it read out the ROM chip without an error and I see stuff here. So there's definitely code that has been read. But the question is, is, is the content here correct? All right, I found a website that has a copy of the 251.968-01 ROM, which is the original version for this 1541C drive. And I've downloaded it. And I will open the ROM and load that into the buffer of this application right here. And then what we can do is we can say verify and it will verify the ROM that I've loaded into the software with what's actually on the chip. And there it is, verify finished. So definitely this chip is not bad. The code that's on here reads perfectly 
and matches this file right here. Okay, I was looking in the Mini Pro software and I went under SRAM and then I did standard SRAM and look, sure enough, it actually has some SRAM here. The part that I just removed from the spare parts board is a 6116 part and that's listed right here. And we're gonna see if this can actually test this SRAM. First, I'll test the one I took off the spare parts board. We'll see if this one is good. Test normal. So the LED blinks and it says test normal. So, okay. Let's try the one I just took off of the drive that's not working. Oh dear. So both of these SRAMs appear to work. Well, that's really annoying. All right, so let's put in the static RAM chip. This is the one from the parts drive and the EEPROM, which we verified as good. And when I turn on the drive, nothing. No change whatsoever. This is a 27128 EEPROM. I burned it with the ROM image that I downloaded off that website. So just in case this ROM chip is perhaps a little flaky or something, this is a different way to test. So we'll turn this drive on. No change at all. So what's really weird, and I've noticed something, now uh, we're looking at one of the address bus pins. When I turn the drive off and on, we get sometimes random things happening. So notice the pulsing you're seeing there. Look, now nothing. I'll go to different pins. Oh, that pin is showing something. But a lot of these pins are just nothing. So if I turn the drive off again, turn it back on, nothing. Nothing. I'm on an address bus line, so we should be seeing something. Here's an address bus signal off. On. Okay, I mean, that looks kind of normal, but look, that's totally different now. Now it's just stuck high. Let's text, check some of the pins. High. Yeah, it's just all of these pins are high. So something seems very, very wrong. The ROM chip we've replaced, SRAM is switched out, and, and it's just, it's super intermittent what's happening here. Okay, so things are looking very, very strange. And there's something I can do that actually will help us test more. And it's this thing right here. This is what's called a no-op generator. Okay, time for a little education break. I wanna talk about what a no-op generator actually is. And let's go back to the book by Rodney Zacks, Programming the 6502. I'll put a link in the description to this book if you wanna check it out yourself. It's a great book on assembly language and how to program the 6502 in general. Here's the page from the book on the opcode no operation or no op, probably also called NOP. Basically this instruction tells the processor to do absolutely nothing, it just waits to cycle and then goes on to execute the next instruction. It is hex code EA, which will come into play in just a moment. Taking a look at the architecture of the 6502, you'll see the microprocessor unit or MPU on the left. On the top is the 8-bit data bus. Down below is the 16-bit address bus. You'll see the ROMs, RAMs, and any programmable I.O. chips. As you probably already know, the 6502 can address 64 kilobytes of address space. As on the last slide, this address space is made up of ROM, RAM, and other mapped I.O. chips. But what's really relevant here is that the 6502 can address 64,000 memory locations total, and a 16-bit number is required to point to all those memory locations. Notice on the top right, zero kilobytes of the memory address space is the same as 0000, 0, 0, 0 hex, or 16 zeros in binary. Down at the bottom, 64K, which is the top of the address space, is the memory location FFFF in hex, or 16 ones in binary. Taking a look at the internal structure of the 6502, what's relevant to this discussion is the program counter, or PC. This is a 16-bit register that points to the current location in memory that the processor is currently pointing. And the 6502 has 16 address lines, and essentially those mirror what the program counter is currently set at. This is relevant to us because the no-op or no-operation opcode essentially tells the processor to do nothing, but then it increments the program counter by one. If you imagine the entire address space was filled with the no-op instruction, the processor could start running at all zeros and would run through its entire address space all the way up to 64K, 
And because the program counter is a 16-bit number, when you add one to a 16-bit number on a processor, it actually overflows back to zero, and it has a carry bit, which in this case is ignored. So the processor will go from the top of address space at FFFF all the way back to 0000, and it will do this forever. Now, how exactly do we fill the entire address space with the opcode EA for no op? Well, the EA hex translates into 11101010 in binary, and all we need to do is take the data bus lines on the processor and hardwire them directly to ground and VCC so that it forms the binary string for EA or the no op instruction. What I did is I took a socket that could plug into a ROM spot on a motherboard and I hardwired it to the VCC and ground to form that instruction. I used a 330 ohm resistor on each data line though, just in case something else on the data bus ever became selected, it could cause a bus conflict. And to prevent a short circuit, the 330 ohm resistor will help drive the bus to the correct values of zeros and ones, as you see here, but also won't fight too hard with another chip on the bus if that tries to control the bus as well. So my no-op generator plugged into a ROM socket will cause the data bus to always read EA, which is the no-op instruction whenever the processor goes to read from the data bus, which has the side effect of turning the 6502 processor into a very fancy binary counter that counts from zero to 65,535 on the address bus lines over and over again. Well, you might ask, why are we doing all of this? Well, one of the reasons is it's a good test of a 6502 processor to make sure it's working correctly. When the no-op generator is running, you can quickly probe the address lines with an oscilloscope and see this binary counting happening. But another reason for doing this is you wanna test the select logic for the various IO and RAM and ROM chips on the board. This is the gate array from this 1541 chip, and you can see on the left, it has address lines that feed into it, and out of it has four select lines. And those four signals that come out of this chip are what instruct the ROM and the RAM and the 26522 chips to be selected, which connects them to the data bus. If the select logic that connects and disconnects the various IO and RAM chips to the data bus is faulty, there's pretty much no way your computer is gonna work correctly. And in this case, because the gate array is an integrated circuit where you can't really tell what's going on, it's just not standard 74 logic, I had to run a test like this where the address lines were counting through the entire address space, so then I could test to see if those select lines are working correctly. So I hope you found this little segment useful about how a no-op generator works and why it's useful. The reason I put this little green wire on here is because I wanted this to be able to work in both 24 pin sockets like this one and 28 pin sockets like this. The biggest difference between these two pins is that right there, that pin, that's five volts, but on this socket, it's up here. So I needed to be able to select if I wanted to take five volts from that pin, like if I was plugged into this socket, or take it from that pin. So as an example, I'll push it down into this socket, and then I connect this green wire to that, that pin right there, which is VCC. And there it is a little closer up. So that's plugged in. But if I was plugging this into this socket, I would be putting the VCC in that pin, which is the same as that pin right there, which is on the little socket itself, which we plugged into all these pins. So this is the RAM, SRAM socket, but it has the same pin out as most of these 24 pin ROMs as well. So like on a Commodore 64, I can plug it into any of the ROM sockets and it will work the exact same way. All right, well, there's a convenient location for me to grab ground right off that pin. So that's for the oscilloscope. And now I'm gonna power up the drive. So on the processor, I'm on bit seven right now, which is high. High is six, high is five, which is correct. Then we should have a zero. Then we have a zero, exactly. And then we have a one, and then we should have a zero, and we do. And then we should have a final one, and we should have a final zero, and we do. So this processor is receiving the no-op instruction right now. So when I check the address lines, it should be cycling through every possible address as it runs through all the possibilities of no-op instruction. It's gonna go through the entire 64K address space and just keep looping around. Now I have the oscilloscope on address line zero, which is pin nine on the 6502. And when we look at the oscilloscope, we see nothing. It's just low. Address line one, 
address line two, address line three. This is not normal. This processor should be going through every single address. We should be seeing pulsing on all of the address lines. I have verified that this no-op generator works perfectly in other 6502 devices and it goes through all the instructions. It works exactly as it's designed. Something is wrong. This processor is not correctly executing. Now there's a pin seven on all 6502s and it kind of is a way to help you tell if the processor is stuck. Like it's run an illegal instruction and is jammed up. When it's operating normally, you actually get a nice square wave on the oscilloscope here output on pin seven. It's called the sync pin. Well, you can see that we are getting that nice square wave. And if I turn the, the drive off and turn it back on, there's a little bit of a delay while it's in reset and then it comes up. But yet, we're not getting anything on the address plus line. It really feels like to me, this processor is not executing this EA instruction properly, which really leads me to believe that this processor is bad. So I'm on an address line and if I turn the drive off and on, it just never seems to start executing anything. It's always just sitting there at zero, at least with the no-op in there. We saw that with the ROM and the RAM in there, we got random things happening on the address bus lines, but with the no-op, we're getting nothing. I think the logical thing for me to do at this point is to yank the CPU out and try a different one. Okay, here's the CPU. I've taken it out. New socket is installed. I put a dot on this CPU just so I don't accidentally misplace it, but it's uh, from the 41st week of 1986. I have this CPU for my spare parts bin. I have no idea if it works. So just in case it's bad, I have another spare CPU right here. Okay, all the cables are connected to the drive, except for the read write heads, which why not? I'll just connect it up anyways. Power, there we go. Everything is ready to go. This is the power LED right here. I'm gonna hit the power and see what happens. No, it's still isn't working. Okay, the replacement processor. Let's check out some of the data lines and address lines on the oscilloscope. High, low, high, low. Yeah, this, this processor actually seems worse than the last one. This is pin seven, which is the sync pulse. And you remember on the last processor, we saw the nice square wave. We're getting absolutely nothing on this one, on that pin, nothing at all. All the address pins, they're just sort of around four volts. Turn it off and on. Oh, there was a little bit of activity there. You see that? Slight amount. And then it just crashes. See? So I have the EEPROM I burned and I have the SRAM from the other 1541 drive, but I've tried the original two from this. Same exact behavior. It's just consistently runs for just a split second, sometimes like that, and then just stops. So this is pin seven. Let's see what happens when I turn the drive on. We get nothing. Oh, there was a little bit of a signal there. Yeah, we saw a split second of the square wave on the sync pin. Okay, well, okay, so this isn't working. Now, I have no idea if this CPU actually works. It was just in a spare parts bin I had. So let's try this extra CPU here, see if this one works better. All right, I'm gonna put a dot on this processor as well, just, just so I can recognize that as a potential bad one. And this was the original one from the drive, so they both have dots on them now. All right, a third 6502 is in here. I'll just leave this EEPROM and that different SRAM in here. Power LED on the front. Let's power this up. Oh. Hey, there was just some activity on the head. And look, the LED lights out. Oh my, this, this is a good sign, everyone. All right, so that's pin seven, the sync pin. And actually interesting is we were just seeing a perfect square wave before well, especially with a no-op generator, but now it seems to be kind of a little bit random. Let's stop it. Single shot. Yeah, okay, so there's sometimes a little bit of spaces in between the square waves. That could be just because certain instructions take longer to run, things like that, but that's a good sign. All right, and notice here on one of the address lines, it's just sort of random stuff happening. And that's, that's what you would expect to see. Oh, there's another one, I mean, that's normal. Right here is what we're seeing is normal operation on a 6502. This 6502 is currently executing code and seems to be working. And same on the data bus lines. There's just all sorts of activity that's happening. If I do a single shot, you'll notice, you know, every time I do it, it's different. 
And that's just because it's sitting here happily executing code. It's reading and writing from the ROM and the RAM, and it's just doing stuff. Okay, so I've turned the drive off again. Now, interesting is this drive has the track zero sensor. Actually, in Commodore speak, it's a track one sensor. And it seems like when you turn on this drive, the ROMs actually instruct the head to go to track zero. Which causes that head bang right there. But that's normal, apparently, for these ROMs. Now, I'd mentioned that there was a jumper right here. It's called J3, and I have to remove this connector to see it. It's this little metal pad right here. Not all of these 1541C drives had the Track Zero sensor. So even though this one has it, with this jumper is connected right now, that means this ROM is not going to use that sensor, which is why we were having the head bang there. That could probably trick people into not realizing that this drive has the sensor and it shouldn't necessarily bang. So I'm going to take a blade and I'm going to cut through the little trace in the middle of this. So I think I've cut through that sufficiently. I'm going to test the continuity with the multimeter. Yep, nothing. So now when I connect this back up and I will move the heads back out of the track zero position, the head should move all the way to the home position, but it shouldn't bang. Here we go. Look at that. No head bang. Oh, oh. So if you have one of these drives and you're having head bang after 30 years of having it, all you got to do is cut through that jumper and of course verify that your drive has the sensor right here. And if it does, you'll never have that head bang again. Okay, I have the Commodore 64 hooked up. Let's turn the drive on. I'll put a floppy disk into the drive and we'll turn the 64 on. So under Adrian's tools, I have the 1541 diagnostic cart here. And right here under performance test, this is gonna run the drive through all of its paces. Let's see what happens. That is so awesome. It passes the entire exercise without any issue. So this sys drive in almost all certainty works perfectly. Why don't I try a good old Sid Burner's number seven on here, see if that loads up. Kind of uses a fast loader. Well, I've finished. It certainly took a very long time, but actually maybe that's normal. Let's run and see if the program loaded. I'm actually just used to having Jiffy DOS on the drives. Oh, it, it did work. I think this is normal. The music's probably playing here. Oh, there's no SID chip. <laughs> there's nothing in here from a SID perspective. So yeah, we're not gonna have any sounds. Okay, anyhow, it did load up. That was a bit weird, but uh, yeah, I think with Jiffy DOS that loads a lot faster. Let's hit a space bar, see if this loads a song. Yeah, now it's, now it's loading some more stuff off the disk. Yeah, okay, so it's working fine. I don't know, that was just weird, but whatever. What this totally confirms to me is that the CPU is working and this ROM is working and so is the SRAM. So it's rather unbelievable that I had a dead CPU on there and my spare parts CPU was bad. So that means I've had three bad 6502s in a row. The previous 1541, which had that dead CPU, and now this one. What are the chances? Well, that's going to be it for this video. Another 1541 fixed and another dead 6502 CPU. I don't know what's going on right now with my luck with those. I hope you found the section on the NOAP generator interesting. I couldn't find a lot of other information, otherwise I would have just referenced someone else's video. But it turned out there wasn't anything I could find, so I just made my own. So if you liked it, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Of course, if you didn't like this entire video, you know what to do. You can give me a thumbs down. Put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. And of course, subscribe for more videos. I'm going to be posting lots more in the future, so you don't want to miss out. All right, then. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.